This is Jeremy Bassetti, and you're listening to Travel Writing World, a podcast featuring interviews with travel writers about their work and about the business and craft of travel writing. You can find the episode show notes, free travel writing resources, and much more at travelwritingworld.com. Wilfred Thesiger was an explorer and writer who sought to travel through the Rub al Khali, the so called empty quarter of desert in the Arabian Peninsula in the late 1940s. Thesiger wrote about his journey in his now classic travel book, Arabian Sands, which was originally published in 1959 and brought the author distinction as an explorer and writer. Joining me today to talk about Arabian Sands is the author and scholar Tim Hannigan. We discuss Thesiger's book in light of his life and his complications as a travel writer with privileged colonial roots. Tim, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me back. So here we are today with the intention of talking about Thesiger's Arabian Sands book that was published in 1950, I believe. 1959, 1959. I think it was. There was, a, there, was a, there was a great long delay between the journeys that the book's about and the writing and then eventually the publishing. I mean, that's one of the interesting things, which I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll talk get about. To that. But this is the first in a new series of classic chats. So I invite other writers and, and journalists to talk about uh, some of the classic works of travel literature, for, for better or worse. And so I'm so happy that you suggested for us to read Arabian Sands. I just finished it. Um, I hadn't read it before. It's a wonderful book, not without some problems, which I'm sure we'll get into, but a a great book uh, to start off with. It it is. It's one of those, one of those solid classics. Um, If you, if you look at 20th century, mid 20th century, British travel literature in particular, uh, it's, it's one that, that, always always jumps out and he is a figure as well as this this uh, remarkable strange problematic and, and troubling but compelling compelling figure uh, this sort of last great explorer which is the title that's so often applied to him and, it, and it's mm. the, the, the book is the book is wonderful as a book in itself but his own strangeness is part of what makes it so compelling as well yes I his think. history is is fascinating uh, he was born into a family with colonial roots, right? His father, I think, was a politician in Ethiopia, and his yeah. uncle was the Viceroy of India, if I'm not mistaken. That That's right. I mean, he's, he, he's, the, he's the sort of ultra-elite traveler from that, <laughs> that aristocratic background. If we talk about the dominance of, of posh white men in, uh, in British travel writing for a very long time, I mean, he's, he's the archetype, really. A genuine, genuinely aristocratic background, born into tremendous privilege, had the, the private income and all of that. Um, he always he always liked to claim that he was born in a mud hut in Addis Ababa, <laughs> where his father was based. But I think I think it was it was probably a slightly rarefied mud hut. It was part of the British legation there. Um, right. Yes, so 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 very much. I mean, he was he was he was steeped in that that uh, that elite aristocratic mm-hmm. and colonial heritage. And he went to school in uh, at Eton. No. <laughs> He, he did indeed. So he's got, he again has the kind of that that classic pedigree. He went to, he went to Eton and then he went on to Oxford. And actually, if you mm. if you look at a, a great swathe of what we might think of as as classic British travel writers of the twentieth century, um, really, really right up to the to the present day, you'll find that that Eton and Oxford pedigree really really dominates. I mean, you've got Thesiger, obviously, people like Robert Byron came out of that background. And then right the way down to the present day, um, Colin Thubron was, was at Eton. Um, right. Rory Stewart was Eton in Oxford. So it's, you know, this, this, is, this is travel writing emerging <laughs> from a hyper privilege. But, the, you know, the interesting thing about this, and I'm sure we'll get into it more, but despite his background of privilege, uh, you know, it seems that it was a background in a lifestyle that he disavowed, or at least he wants us to believe that he disavowed, disavowed right? He, he seems to, uh, in Arabian Sands, prefer the nomadic, unmaterialistic way of life. <laughs> 
He he does. Um, I don't mean that's that's one of the fascinating things about his character. <laughs> and he, and, it, and it, I think it's fair to say that in Thesiger's case, it, it, he it wasn't just talk. Uh, it's a fairly I think it's a fairly common pose amongst uh, British men of that background, probably even up to the to the present day of oh yes, I like going off and roughing it in the desert, but then kind of going <laughs> going going home to the mansion. And and Thesiger did come home to the mansion, or rather to his mother's apartment in London generally. He did come home, but he I think more than more than virtually all of the other um sort of aristocratic British travellers of b- before him and since him more than any other he he, re- he really did live the life that he uh, he sort of portrayed in his books he right. spent he spent very much of his time in these in these far-flung places away from away from luxury so yeah and he, he has- did he did he did relish it and he did he did seem to want to live that life he has some serious travel chops right he as you mentioned he was born in Addis Ababa and traveled extensively around the Arabian Peninsula to Yemen what you know UAE Oman as we get at in this book Saudi Arabia Iraq um Kurdistan just, you know <laughs> maybe he's a poser but he can back it up right Oh, absolutely, yeah. And and in the period after the time in in the deserts in uh, in in southern Arabia, he was then for for uh, I think seven or eight years, largely based in Iraq, living in the the now mostly vanished marshes of southern Iraq, mm. um, living living amongst sort of local local people there. Um, and he would spend he would spend part of the year there brief trips back to London. Um, and then, and then the hot part of the year, he'd mainly be wandering around in the mountains in Iran, Kurdistan, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And he kept this up for a remarkably long time in, in his sort of later years. He lived in Kenya in a fairly remote, remote part of Kenya. Mm. Um, and only actually came back to, to the UK very late in life. Um, he died in 2003 in his, in his mid nineties, uh, having, having come back because of poor health very late in life, but most of his life was, was spent away from, away from Britain. Mm-hmm. And of course the, the book that commemorates his time in Iraq, the one that we remember is, uh, as, as you kind of alluded to the Marsh Arabs and, you know, what fascinates me about the book Arabian Sands, and I'm sure it's the case for the Marsh Arabs. I haven't read that yet, regrettably, but, um, as you, you mentioned, he's living with local people, right? He's not going to these places and kind of living in these posh environments. He's, you know, getting his hands dirty, um, oftentimes wearing the garb of the local people. He can speak the language, you know, he's, he's, he's in it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's there's whatever whatever the kind of problems with the the power dichotomy and the and the of course sort of colonial undertones you can't you can't fault him on that on that front. He certainly wasn't an excursionist. He 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 was deeply deeply immersed. Um, and you know the the kind of things he did. He wasn't a professional anthropologist, but they they were the kind of extended periods, extended immersions that you would that you would get in classical anthropology as well. Um, mm-hmm. With that you know, that that the language skills and the and the really kind of deep deep immersion living alongside the people he was he was writing about. Mm-hmm. So. Um- I guess we'll uh, jump into talking about the book Arabian Sands, and we'll, we'll also mention again Marsh Arabs um, as another very important book that he wrote. And because we'll come back to the question of photography, I hope there is a. I think the last book that was published in his lifetime was a photography book called A Vanish World. And one of the very interesting things that I, I learned about Thesiger as I was preparing for this and, and reading his his book is that he took a a film, of course it was film. He took a camera with him uh, on his journeys just for the, for the listeners, Tim, you uh, you sent me an article prior to recording this conversation that you wrote about uh, your time in the archives of Thesiger. And what I learned from your article is that in his private journals, he didn't say a lot about his journeys into the Arabian sands, which we'll talk about but where he doesn't write a lot, he does leave behind a lot of photography from that period. So it's as if he's preoccupied with photographic evidence, not necessarily the the, the written evidence. 
Yeah, yeah I mean, he, he he kept he kept sort of meticulous professional diaries. I mean, every every day's march was recorded, uh, so he was able always years later to say exactly where he went when. Um, but it wouldn't have it wouldn't have the impressionistic detail in there that you'd expect and that you'd find in in the kind of diaries and journals of lots of other lots of other great travel writers. It didn't there have a be- writerly hand. In it, it's, no, yeah. it, it, it tends to be very much marched 20 miles, camped at Wadi X, uh, water very brackish, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so it was, it was, it was very clear, very, very scientific, if you like. Um, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't find any emotion in it, certainly, and you wouldn't find any impressionistic detail. Although some of that does turn up in his letters. He was a, he was a great letter writer to his mother, who lived to a great age. Um, and, and when you read his letters to his mother you find some of that that sort of impressionistic detail coming through this is one of the most remarkable things when you look at the book because the book and all of his books are are remarkably atmospheric and remarkably sort of finely grained in the detail of of the journeys mm-hmm. and that was when i when i went to look at his archive materials which is all held at Eaton, where he was at school now. Uh, that was one of the things that, that shocked me um, because reading the books, you, you think, gosh, this is somebody who must have been writing down every last detail on on the road or in the desert. Um, but it doesn't seem so. It seems that he had a very clear, he had, he had the maps, he had the photographs, he had the, the sort of the practical details of what he did, but the, all that rich impression of the place and of the atmosphere that you get in the book seems to have not been written down until he wrote the books. Mm-hmm. And of course he could have referred back to the photographs for remembering those things um, as he was writing. But you know, this, you know, before we get into the book, this poses some interesting questions of veracity in travel literature, right? You know, this is a question that I recently thought about uh, with Jonathan Chatwin as we talked about Bruce Chatwin and the authentic traveler, right? What what do we believe? Are the things uh, that we're reading, are they really true or are they fabricated to some degree? Yes. And, and, and again, that was something that the I, I found quite shocking as somebody who's been reading Thesiger since my teenage years. I'd always <laughs> put him I'd put him on the non Bruce Chatwin side. I mean, everyone knows you can't rely on Bruce Chatwin, but I'd assumed and um, possibly this is some kind of hardwired British deference to these old Etonians thinking, oh, that they, you know, you can trust them. We we kind of know that you can't these days, but maybe you thought in, in the earlier generations you could. And maybe maybe that's why I, I just had always assumed that Thesiger was a was a hyper reliable travel writer. And it was only when I looked at the the materials, the original materials, the journals, that I began to have some slight Light doubts, and but in a way, it, it, it made it made the books richer for me because it made me see them more as literary works, as works of the imagination. I mean, I, to, to be clear, I don't think I don't think any of the 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 basic events of what happens in the book are in any way invented. I mean, they all tally with what's in the diaries. He went to place X at, on day Y, and and so on. I don't think there's I don't think there's any any uh, question marks over any of that. He went where he said he went, he went when he said he went, and he went with who he said he went in the circumstances he said. But I just think that some of that, some of that, that kind of, and there is an element of emotion in the book and there is an awful lot of dialogue mm-hmm. um, with with his companions who are all, all Bedou from, from the desert. Um, I think some of that has to be looked at as, as a, as a, partially imaginative recreation of a journey that that was for him the, the most important period in his life i mean he said that he says that in the book and he says that he said that right through to the end of his the end of his days that those five years he spent in southern arabia from, from 19 1945 to, to to roughly 1950 that was that was the the high point of his life really mm-hmm. yeah i guess you know for the travel writer they you know must take some sort of poetic license to to clean up 
dialogue and make it more <laughs> make it more appealing for the the reading experience right after all it is it is a book yeah of, of course and and i mean i think it's it's worth pointing out that the book wasn't the book was published in in 1959 so that's 10 years after he'd left uh, and he was writing it in a couple of years prior to that mm. so he was looking back at it it's not quite the kind of epic distance that you have between patrick lee for moore's journey and the time of gifts that's sort of 30 years or more um but it was still he, he was still looking back on things that had happened a decade earlier um with lots right. of intervening travels and obviously he was he was he was an older man he was well in his 40s by the time he, he wrote the book um nearly 50 actually um so it was uh yeah he, he was looking back and it, and it comes through that filter of memory and it comes through that filter of nostalgia as well, because it, it was a period that he, he by that stage, saw as, as lost. I mean, politically, he wasn't able to go back there. And he, mm. he also felt that, you know, development, the oil industry had also come into the region and, and everything, everything that he valued, that he sort of aestheticized had, had been had been lost. So it's a nostalgic book as well. It's a kind of belated book. Right. He, he, he does. Now that you mention it, you're reminding me he does you know, refer to places like uh, souks and um, just various cities that he knew well. He referred to them as unspoiled. Um, oh yes, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, this is this is where Thesiger is is definitely problematic from a uh, from a from a post colonial perspective. I mean, he's the absolute epitome of the of the the elite traveler from the West who basically wants elsewhere the places <laughs> to be authentic. There's this there's this 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 line in um, very early in the book where where he says, um, I, I, "I craved for the past, I resented the present." And I dreaded the future, <laughs> um, which which was sort of his attitude. He, he said, I, I abhor the internal combustion engine and all of this kind of thing. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, he, he, he was, he really is the epitome of the travel writer who wants, who wants the, the other, the travelee, the places he's traveling to, to be, be, be perfectly preserved in a kind of rhetorical past for him to go and him to go and travel through. And, and that's where, that's where he's problematic. And he's, and he's been, he's certainly been fingered by, by post-colonial scholars for, mm. for that. And, and there's, there's no question about it. He's, he's problematic in that respect. But I, I do think, I do think when you read the book and when you read it closely, that there's, there's, there's more going on. Cause he's not, as I said, he's not an excursionist. He's right. not, he's not, He's not a tourist who's just turning up and getting upset that there's a McDonald's. I mean, he was he was committedly immersed in these places. Yeah, there's something there. There's a there. There's a there. There. There's at least he leads us to believe there's an honest attempt to understand a people and a place and to describe it as affectionately and as realistically as possible. Absolutely, and and um, I, I think I think when you read closely, uh, particularly when you go back to it again, you, you find that there are these, you know, there are these little moments of self reflection, of reflexivity in there. There's he so talks good. at one point, yeah, and he talks about he talks about a sense of guilt that he's potentially an agent for the change that he resents and worries. And then there are moments where he, you know, he, he reflects on, on how well he's routinely treated by the people he travels amongst and wonders what would happen if one of them came to, came to London. Oh and, yeah, that was how, great. Yeah. So he, so he is, there's, 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 there's more, more going on than, than a simple kind of obnoxious um, late <laughs> colonial traveler. Definitely. Yeah. I'll, I'll read a quote. I actually pulled a quote on, on this very subject on, on humility, uh, on on just why he breaks down what we would expect to read, or at least what I expected to read. And so this is the quote. I went there with a belief in my own racial superiority, but in their tense, I felt like an uncouth, inarticulate barbarian, an intruder from the shoddy materialistic world. Yet from them, I learned how welcoming the Arabs and how generous is their hospitality. So th th this is just kind of a you know a throwaway line in his book, but there you know there are many examples of this, and we get the sense that he's being honest here. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think I think I would say that you can you can go another another level be beyond that, um, and if you have to remember what what an elite minority background Thesiger came from, you know, he comes from this this very small 
very small social class um, from the most elite school, most elite university, most elite social background. And I think there's a certain a certain element, and this does come up in some other sort of late colonial and colonial British travel writers about about the Middle East, about about Arabia. This this sense of slight affinity with these mm-hmm. these idealised, uh, you know, particularly the Bedou, these these travellers. I think I think in a way there's a sense that that oh well, these are people like me, you know, I'm this I'm this <laughs> elite figure from from outside the normal society. You know, these are people who are not amongst the townsfolk, and that, it, it, if you. Read the book there's a lot of disparagement of the the settled arabs and some of it comes from his companions but he very much signs up for that that you know the the arabs who farm or who live in the town are, are sort of uh, uh lesser beings and the, the the true the true arabs are these these bedu people out in the desert right. traveling with nothing and i think there's a certain there's a certain kind of mapping of 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 the the upper echelons of the british class system against these these kind of elite elite bedou travelers so i think some Psychologically on, on Thesiger's part, there's something something going on around there. I think that's partly why he he had this this attraction to them that that they were almost like like um, him. <laughs> though, yeah, although although sort of economically uh, from a very different different part of the uh, the, the power spectrum, even with their own uh, society, this idea right. of them as an elite, uh, as as kind of more rarefied and more initiated than everyone else, was something that he that he identified with. And I wonder, you know, to what extent this has affinities with the, you know, the idea of the noble savage I, I, yeah, that I we mean, hear so I, much you about. Thesiger definitely, although again with with complications, um, because he he doesn't um, he he doesn't attempt to he doesn't attempt to portray any of the peoples he travelled amongst as kind of as as wholly untouched. Um, he. he but attempts to put them across as civilized on terms of terms of civilization that he understood as a, as a European, but definitely definitely the noble savage concept is is floating around there somewhere. But mm-hmm. then I think he probably he probably would have in a way thought of himself as a kind of noble savage. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Um, l- look, let's let's talk about the book. We're talking about <laughs> we're talking about the problems. Let's talk about the book really quickly in terms of the premise and and, and the plot, and then we'll go back to these topics. So. Arabian Sands. The premise basically is is what he wants to explore the empty quarter, the Rub al Khali. Rub al yeah. Um, Rub al Khali. He always calls it the Sands, um, which is what he said the the the, the Bedou who kind of lived and travelled through it called it. He said they never called it the empty quarter, which is what the, the Rub al Khali is usually translated as. Um, he was basically on on this epic gap year. He'd he'd uh, he'd served in in the Second World War, and then at the end of it, he he got this he got this sort of um, sort of job for the Middle East anti locust. Um, unit, which was a kind of one, one of another of these late colonial offshoots that was meant to sort of be researching to find out um, find out where locust plagues came from and where exactly they emerged from in the Middle East. But it, he was basically given a license to go where he wanted and do what he wanted. He never talks about money and budgets, never talks about picking up paychecks or whether he filed expenses for any of this stuff. And he basically spent five years wandering around and he he kind of uh, collected this this small crew um, of of companions who were all from from some of the the, the southern Bedou groups, um, and and he, he went on these incredibly hardy, incredibly long camel journeys with them. Two of which actually crossed the the sands on the empty quarter at the middle of the at the middle of the Arabian desert, which uh, which had, had be, I mean it was something that local people had done and did but it was not it wasn't a regular a particularly regular route mm-hmm. um you know his his guide on the first journey al alf had, had traveled it before but it this wasn't this was not a journey that that local people took lightly uh, by any means right. um so it's those those two crossings crossings of the sands are the centerpiece of the book um the first part he talks something about his background and then towards the end there are these these much more fraught journeys uh into into a man and along the kind of gulf coast where where you sense that things are becoming politically more difficult uh, mm-hmm. that's in the final part but the the two great set pieces are these these remarkable crossings of of the sands with a very small group of companions and very little water <laughs> and what what he seems to be excited about is the fact that 
He is one of the first Europeans to cross the sands. As you mentioned, uh, you know, the locals have, have crossed them at these points for God knows how long, but he is very proud of the, of the fact that he was the first European to do so while, and this was interesting to me, discounting uh, the crossings by Philby and Thomas, who had done it, I don't know, a decade or two before him, at a different Less difficult part to use. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah, oh, yeah. Ever a man for fine detail there. Yeah. They went across, but they didn't go across where he went across. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there is this this uh, um, kind of notion of uh, exploration for the sake of exploration, right? He wanted to do it just because he wanted to do it. He wasn't interested, he tells us, about the what would result from the journey. He wasn't interested in, uh, it doesn't seem anything else but the sake of getting lost in the sands yeah there, there's a there's a wonderful line somewhere in the book where he sort of says the only reward was a drink of clear almost tasteless water um <laughs> i mean obviously there was a book and renown that was the, the kind of greater rewards really but he and this is where he's such a strange belated figure because that the age of imperial exploration had ended you know you didn't need to make these journeys to make the maps the the region could be overflown and mapped from the air you know and people would be driving across it in land rovers very soon afterwards so so this is not one of the those kind of authentic uh, journeys of of exploration in which blanks or maps are properly filled uh it's kind of uh it's it's done for its own sake yeah very much i mean it, it fits it fits in with that that strange period in the tail end of of the british empire really where where you get the the ascent of everest and and then you get Thessaly mm. doing this to so these these men all from the same elite background all somehow somehow sort of emotionally damaged it seems by the first world war in the case of the everest expeditions and then by by just his own background and whatever in Vesta's case that these these guys doing these these really absurd exercises but with this absolute kind of emotional commitment to it right yeah somewhere uh, in the book he he re- well at, at many points throughout the book he refers to mountain climbing and he compares what he's doing to climbing a summit or, you know, reaching the peak. And somewhere in the book, he says something to the effect of, you know, no one ever questions the reason why a mountain climber climbs up to the peak. They climb up to the peak to f- climb to the peak, right? <laughs> and, yeah. and, of, and of course, like, there are dunes and peaks in, in the desert. So I think the analogy is a fitting one, but you're right. I, th- I think, you know, this is, he's part of a, he belongs to a certain era. He's a man, a privileged man of a certain era who's going out and exploring for the sake of exploration, he, he tells us. Yeah, uh, but I think the really, really important thing to remember about Thesiger, and, and this is what sets him apart from all those mountain climbers and so on, is that throughout all his travels, he really stresses that it was the companionship of local people that that was essential to him. He had mm. no interest in journeying on his own. Uh, and I think sort of real high altitude mountaineering had no appeal to him because that didn't really involve that kind of companionship and traveling with local people as they travel. I mean, sure. If he'd if he'd have gone and climbed Everest, he'd have he'd have been with 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 local guides and porters. But it wouldn't have been the way they travelled, and that's that's what he always seemed to want to do. He wanted to travel in the same way that local people made journeys, and he wanted to be in the company of local people. Right. And um, he, yeah. And he wanted to dress like them too. Right. Uh, he he describes clothes. He describes putting on his clothes and you know taking off his watch so that he. Um, doesn't get recognized as someone who doesn't belong there. Like he, he wants to live with them, like them. He wants to fit in. He wants to integrate. Yeah, he does. But I mean, again, that's that sort of problematic from a post-colonial perspective because yeah, yeah, yeah. that 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 trope of the 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 white explorer in disguise as a as an Arab, as an Afghan horse trader or whatever is a, is a very familiar one, and it, and power is written <laughs> very deep into it because right. there's a there's a sort of latent assumption that Thesiger can pass himself off not as a Bedou, but he might get away with passing himself off as a town Omani or somebody from Syria, which yeah. is what his his companions do try to pass right, him off exactly. as when, when they meet people who might be hostile to him. There's an assumption that, well, he can do that, but you certainly wouldn't, wouldn't assume, or his readers and he himself, his original readers or he himself, it would have been absurd to think of Al-Auf or Bin Kabina or Bin Gabaisha 
passing themselves off as Englishmen in London. So, um, so that that power dynamic is is there, and I and it's something I do always think whenever you whenever you um, you read these accounts of these sort of explorers travelling in disguise, did was anyone actually convinced by them? You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it was was everyone they actually met going, oh, he's a Syrian, is he? All oh, right, okay, <laughs> sure, um, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah, that that the the kind of dressing up box element was. Well, he was, does he does yeah. re- reference that at some point people in his uh in his caravan mention oh yeah he's a syrian and, and he makes an aside s- stating something to the effect of oh they don't know what a syrian is <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure i'm not sure they've <laughs> ever seen one so of course i could pass off as a, as a syrian <laughs> yeah 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 that's it and i mean he you know it's sometimes sometimes the way he's portrayed by his or has been portrayed by his his sort of most devoted fans um doesn't actually entirely do him justice you get this thing oh you know he was an absolutely fluent arabic speaker who could pass himself off as an arab and all of this kind of thing and when you read the book actually he doesn't say that you know he right. he, he makes it clear that he you know sometimes had problems with the language sometimes couldn't quite understand what was going on um and and he doesn't he doesn't really sort of claim that he was able to fully pass himself off uh, uh, amongst these people as as one of them um so so that again as as always when you actually read into read into the text it's mm-hmm. it's not quite as simplistic as as it might seem right what made me a little bit uneasy with this book uh, apart from what we've already touched on or in addition to that is you know some of the generalizations about the Arab races and about their race. I mean, he talks about the different tribes in, in kind of a way that, you know, you read about dog breeds and their dispositions <laughs> and their behaviors yeah. and their sizes and their, you know, the, the you know, these types of, um, the, you know, they're docile and, you know, they're <laughs> intelligent. Yeah. And, they and, are certain, about, yeah and, and certain other ones are avaricious or whatever right, it would greedy be. Greedy yeah. and. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so that made me, it made me uncomfortable, but I was also thankful that he didn't bust out the calipers and start to measure heads, right? Um, Because I I was just reading a book about Percy Fawcett um, and, you know, his journeys into the Amazon and he did that, right? He took out a... (laughs) some measurements you know, it was measuring people's heads and, and things so i mean I, I mean i think i think a slight element of that sneaks into the photography um because they're they're very much and well they're, they're, the, his photography is striking and he, he supposedly was was very uh, very sparing um you know, there was an interview with him late in life and he said, no he didn't shoot off vast reels he, he would often take just one photo a day and that was the photo that ended up in the book he was very wow. pre- precise and meticulous about it but they do sometimes less so in less Less so in Arabia because they were mostly of his own companions. But when you look at some of the pictures from from later journeys, particularly in in uh, Central Asia, they do have a bit of the characteristics of here is a specimen of a, <laughs> uh, a Pashtun man or a Kalash woman or whatever it might be. So so a slight element of the calipers creeps in in the uh, in the photography at, at, at time. But no, he, he didn't he didn't actually go around measuring skulls. Fortunately, yeah. there's there's a website uh, and I'll put the link in the show notes. Uh, that has a, a large number of his photography, and uh, you know, despite those issues, I mean, some of them are just stunning. You can actually see pictures of his one of his most favorite companions, Bin Kabina. Uh, you can see images of him uh, as a young boy, maybe sixteen, seventeen, when they first kind of begin traveling together, until his early adulthood, and just to to, to have that kind of document. Uh, Bin Kabina is a is a is a real person, is striking and it's wonderful. I think I think there's something else just just worth saying about the the, the quality of the photos and the quality of the writing. I mean, it, it's it's easy to it's easy to overlook that in all the problems and the issues that that this is incredibly incredibly uh, fine aesthetic sense that he has both visually and in the writing. Oh, his writing is uh, polished. So and so, so restrained and so evocative without being lush and without being rich. I mean, it's very apt to the landscape he's traveling in. Mm. Um, really, really fine, high style. And, and actually, when you, if you've gone to the Marsh Arabs, which is 
the later book, the Marsh Arabs, it's even more so. I mean, the opening, the opening lines of the Marsh Arabs are just the most remarkably restrained um, and, and finely stylish pieces of mid 20th century travel writing. Uh, I, the Arabian Sands is in a way the greater travel book because it's about the greater journey. The Marsh mm-hmm. Arabs is just about the time living there. But um, but in, in both of them, the, the writing is just remarkable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, the photography, I haven't looked through it very much, but what I did see on that website and what I've seen in the uh, in the book of photography of Vanished World is is just wonderful aesthetic sense as you mentioned beautiful photography yes yeah um, I, I, I think I think absolutely as I, as I was saying earlier um, although although when I looked at the the archival materials there wasn't there weren't records of conversations <laughs> there weren't records of how he felt at certain moments so some of that has to be has to be judged as 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 uh, not not made up but filtered through memory filtered through the right. way he idealized it himself 10 years later but in terms of the actual journey himself I, I don't think we I don't think we need to doubt at all what 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 happens in the book mm-hmm. did happen in in the fundamentals so I'm going to put you on the spot how would you rate this book out of five? Out of five? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> five, na- five narrows it, Jeremy. If you give me 10, <laughs> then you get more kind of more. I would, um, oh, dear out of me. 10, out that's of 10. Very, that's, <laughs> no, no, no. We'll go with five. We'll go with five. I'll, I'll take a Thessager like approach and go for the hardest, <laughs> the hardest route. Um, I, I think I would have to give it four, uh, okay. just because it's such a remarkable thing. I, I you, you have to take something off for its problems. I think, I think almost by default, Pretty much every every travel book written <laughs> written um, it's beyond the last couple of years needs one knocked off just for just for some <laughs> of the problems associated with the genre in general. So I'm going to knock one off for that. But just as a as a, so a, perfect a score. remarkable piece of writing, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think I, I think he gets the default the default perfect. Um, yeah, we'd we'd call that we'd call that seventy seventy point five in, in <laughs> sort of <laughs> marking a paper or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah it's 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 a remarkable book. It's, it's incredibly written. Um, it's it's uh, a portrait of a remarkable place and a lot of remarkable people in it. And it's also um, also a portrait of this strange and remarkable man. And for me, that's that's one of the one of the redemptions of all of these problematic uh, travel writers of of the past. Uh, at that time, they were writing these travel books for an audience back home generally in England um, who were sort of elite from a fairly elite background themselves they were writing for a middle class even upper middle class audience themselves but when we read them now the people who are doing the telling so Thessager in this case uh, they're they're exotic to us as well they're they're the other um, so so you, you when you read it you're encountering this what to him and to most of his audience and to us now is an exotic world but you're also encountering this possibly the most exotic part of it all is Thessager himself. Yeah, the, the, the specimen. <laughs> Thessager, yeah. yeah, it's not just a portrait of the other, but it gives us a portrait of, of the self. And I think, you know, that's one of the uh, the interesting things about travel writing is that you know, people who read travel writing very closely, as you do, well, you know, will will understand and kind of read into you know, this double-edged approach um, or, you know, this kind of very rich potential of travel writing. We get a portrait of the other and also a self-portrait. And that's you wonderful. do that. That's that's what travel writing. That's what the best travel writing is 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 always about. And it's and it's always there, even if it doesn't appear to be on the surface. You just need to read a little bit more closely, and you'll find that that other edge in there somewhere. Well, that's a good reminder. Thank you, uh, Tim, for coming on the podcast. Uh, any parting words? Uh, once you've read this one, once you've read Arabian Sands, do do have a look at the Marsh Arabs. The pair of them are, are amazing books. He, he put out a great flurry of of books very late in life. Actually, right? he was publishing into his nineties and through the the nineteen nineties. Some of them are okay. There's one among the mountains, which is which is worth reading. His biography, which I think was published in the late nineties, called A Life of My Choices, is, is pretty pretty dull. It's in a weird way, it's less revealing than the travel books, or maybe not in a weird way. Mm. Maybe that's what to to expect. But um, but certainly Arabian Sands and, and the Marsh Arabs, are, whether you read them just as sort of aesthetic literary works or as portraits of a strange man or of portraits of, of interesting places, they're, they're highly recommended. Well, good. And um, just to come back to this, uh, I'd mentioned that you sent me in an email a chapter on an article that you wrote about Thesiger. Can you tell us where that comes from? <laughs> 
Yeah, it's from a it's from a, a book actually, uh, which should be out next year. Um, which is a travel book about travel writing. Um, its working title is the Travel Writing Tribe. So I'm looking at all these strange and exotic travel writing creatures. Uh, I've sort of flipped flipped the lens and turned turn it back from uh, from the the the, the Bedu tribesmen back onto the onto the travel writers themselves. So it's it features quite a lot of living travel writers who I speak to in person, and then it's one or two one or two dead ones of of whom Thestia is one so uh, that, that book should be out next spring um, but I will keep you posted yeah keep us posted and let's talk about it when it comes out definitely you can find the episode show notes and much more at travelwritingworld.com Please remember to subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app. And if you find the show valuable, please consider leaving a review or supporting the show with only a few dollars a month at patreon.com forward slash travel writing world. Thanks for your support.